and sit down. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Janessa After Dark. It has been a hot minute, several hot minutes, many hot minutes, a hot hour. I don't even know. It has been a long time since we did an episode of Janessa After Dark and it was about time to get in front of the microphone and give you another podcast episode. I'm going to give you a little bit of a life update. I mean, we all know the whole goddamn world is on fire and I'll tell you a little bit about what took this episode so long. There will be a longer life update in my upcoming episode of Miss J the Renovation. That's going to be episode number nine. That's the Midway Check Point, and that should be coming soon to SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher as well. But basically, I've just had a lot of life changes going on. I changed teams at my job, so I'm still working for the same company, but I switched the area that I'm working in, and it's actually a pretty significant change in terms of the way that I work and the type of things that I'm working on. So that's been a big adjustment, as well as just the world of COVID. What does it mean to be stuck inside your goddamn house all the time on lockdown, watching all those idiot young people running around without masks on, not washing their goddamn hands, making everybody sick? And so there's just been a lot going on. And of course, I always have many, many projects going on. So if you don't know, I did recently start a YouTube channel. I've been doing that for about four months. If you want to check it out, I'll make sure that I link it in the description of this podcast episode. And if you go to YouTube.com, my username is Janessa J. Champagne. And just like on this podcast, I do all kinds of content related to glam, geek, and gore. Of course, my primary focus over there is on makeup content. It seemed to make more sense to do it over there where you can actually see the makeup rather than on this podcast. But we do a little bit of horror content. We do some geeky content from time to time as well. So you'll get a little bit more of what we do over here at the podcast on my YouTube channel. Please go give it a subscribe, watch a couple videos, give it some thumbs up, leave some comments. We definitely appreciate all of the engagement that you can give us when you're a new channel, when you're starting out. It's so difficult to build and so we're trying to hit a hundred subscribers by the end of September 2020. I think we can do it. Uh, It's been slow. We hit 80 pretty quickly and now it's been a little bit slow trying to grow from there. So if you have the time, if you have the inclination, I would absolutely appreciate it. If you wanted to come over and subscribe to my YouTube channel, again my channel name is Janessa J. Champagne just like it's spelled here and you'll find more great content related to glam geek and gore. All right, so this is, of course, the sixth regular length episode of Janessa After Dark for Series 2. You'll notice I changed it from Season 2 to Series 2. I've decided that a series is 10 episodes, and we'll have six regular episodes, two of the Sloppy Seconds episodes, at least one very special episode, and then a wild card, and that's going to be a series, just because I can't get myself to commit to a recording schedule, so it makes more sense to commit to a format and then just fit the episodes in as we get to them. So that's what's going on. So this, of course, is the last regular length episode of series two. And after that will be the next Sloppy Seconds episode. If you haven't checked out a Sloppy Seconds episode before, they are a little bit shorter in length than our regular episodes. And what they feature are outtakes or just little extra stories that didn't make it into our main episodes featuring interviews with the last three guests on the podcast. So that means that the Sloppy Seconds that will be coming out after this episode will feature outtakes from today's guest as well as Crystal Connor, horror author extraordinaire, and makeup artist and burlesque performer Katie Cadaver. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before we can get to the sloppy seconds, we have to get to this episode's interview. I am super excited for this episode's guest. She is a horror icon. Even if you don't know her name, I promise you, you know her scene. And so we're going to get to her a little bit later. But before we dive into the interview, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of the first girls. So not the final girls, 
but the first girls. In her book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Carol J. Clover coined the term the final girls. And if you're a fan of slasher horror, you know who they are. If we think about the first movie from the big three franchises of the 70s into the 90s, she's talking about Alice from Friday the 13th, she's talking about Nancy from Nightmare on Elm Street, and of course she's talking about Laurie Strode from Halloween. In the chapter Her Body, Himself, she charts the journey of the final girl, and how the final girl is often set up as being differently gendered than the other women featured in the film. She's sort of a light contrast to the killer himself. Whereas he is a frustrated, sometimes feminized man who isn't able to actually connect with women and instead has to destroy them, she is a masculinized woman who is not as prone to the trappings of femininity. She often has a slightly less feminine name and presentation, and she's sort of a contrast to the killer where she has to take on a lot of the masculine qualities from society in order to eventually defeat the killer at the end of the film. And in terms of gender studies and looking at what horror has to tell us about the world and about the society in which we live, absolutely the final girl is very important. It's become this trope and this recognizable symbol for a reason. Those final girls really do represent something about what these films are trying to say. But before we get to the message, before we get to the idea behind the film, we have to set up the characters, we have to set up the setting, and we have to give you an introduction to the killer. And that's where I think the first girls become very, very important. If the final girl is about the message of the movie, then the first girl is about the medium itself. What I think is most important when talking about first girls is to remember that they really only matter in the first film of a franchise. I mean, at this point, it's hard to imagine a world that doesn't have Jason Voorhees, that doesn't have Michael Myers, that doesn't have Freddy Krueger. But when the first films in each of these franchises came out, that was the world that people were coming into. They weren't familiar with these icons. And so that first kill in a film really has to establish who the killer is, how they work, what the setting is, what the stakes are. And so the first big cinematic kill really is emblematic of how the movie is going to progress. And that, I believe, even affects how the franchise itself progressed. That's why it's so important for that first film to get the first girl right. Because every film in a franchise is going to have some iteration of the final girl. There's going to be somebody who survives to the end to tell the tale, or at least seems to. But as they say, you only have one chance to make a first impression. So let's look a little bit closer at the first girl from each of those big three franchises. Starting with the earliest, 1978's Halloween. The film opens with a point of view camera that follows some perspective as it's peering in the windows, looking at Sandy Johnson playing Judith Myers, a young woman with her boyfriend making out, and then they go upstairs. And then the perspective goes in through the back door to the kitchen, grabs a knife, goes out through the house. We see the boyfriend coming down the steps and leaving, and then the perspective goes upstairs. And at some point in that progression, a mask goes over the face of the person that we're following. And so the camera is shooting basically through two small eye holes, as if we were actually seeing through the eye eye holes of this mask. We are in the eyes of this person through the camera. And so they open up into Judith's bedroom and there's Sandy Johnson sitting topless and she's attacked with a knife and she's killed. In the next scene, we see that the killer is actually a small cherubic blonde child in a clown outfit. This is Halloween night. He's dressed up for trick or treating and he's just murdered his sister. Now that scene and the way that it was shot are so iconic. There are so many people that even if they haven't seen the movie, even if they don't really understand 
understand the history of slasher films and all of that, you can show them a picture of Sandy Johnson as Judith Myers through the eye holes of that mask in that scene, and they will know where that comes from, or they'll at least know that it's important to Michael Myers or to Halloween or to something like that. And so it's really iconic. Visually, it's something that's really important to the history of that genre. And it also helps establish themes that go throughout the whole Halloween franchise. It's really about the nature of evil. Where does evil come from? And so before, you know, in the 50s, we had these nuclear horror films where horror came from the advances of science. So nuclear power would cause monsters to grow. And then we have the switch that happens with Psycho. And Psycho is extremely important for the development and history of horror because that's where we start to see that perhaps horror is all around us. Horror is right next door. Horror is that sweet, awkward, smiling boy at the motel. This tries to do something very similar. And so it establishes this small, delicate, sweet looking blonde child as this instrument of pure, unadulterated evil. And that first scene with Sandy Johnson as Judith Myers is so important to setting up those themes that are going to run through the entire franchise. We have a similar sort of thing with Friday the 13th. Now, we have to cheat a little bit when we're talking about this because technically there are two murders before the character that I consider the first girl. So at the very, very opening of the film, it flashes back to the 50s when Camp Crystal Lake is open and there are some counselors sitting around a bonfire singing camp songs and two kind of sneak off and they go have sex up in this barn or whatever they get killed off we don't get any sense of who the killer is it's very quick it's in the dark you don't really see much it's not very visually appealing but you get this moment of this happened in the past and this is why the camp is shut down and then we go to Annie and we see Annie walking into town she's got a backpack she's hitchhiking she's fresh face she's beautiful she's you know, chipper and happy, and she's walking along, and she encounters some townspeople, including Crazy Ralph, who tells her about the death curse, who tells her about Camp Blood, and how she's doomed if she goes out there, and this really establishes something that's important for the franchise, which is that as much as it's about Jason Voorhees and Pamela Voorhees, it's also about Crystal Lake, that this one is really about place. So while Halloween is about the nature of evil and the sometimes unexpected vessels of evil that we find in the world, this is more about places that are evil, places that are haunted by our actions, our choices. And that's why we're able to have a switch of the primary killer. And the killer isn't really defined very well until the third film. So the first film obviously has Mrs. Voorhees. The second film has Jason, but he's got a bag over his head and he's hardly ever seen and then we get into the third film and he's still kind of in the shadows but eventually he ends up with that hockey mask and that's where the icon of Jason really solidifies and even then they still struggle making a differentiation between Jason Voorhees and the place of Crystal Lake so in the third film he gets the hockey mask then in the fourth film we've got a really strong Jason presence and then at the end Tommy Jarvis kills him. And then we have these three films that are sort of the Tommy Jarvis arc. Part four, part five, and part six. And so part four is where Tommy Jarvis at the end kills Jason. In part five, Tommy Jarvis is sort of maybe going crazy and he goes to this inpatient treatment facility where they're trying to help him. And in that film, the Jason Voorhees that appears isn't the real Jason. It's Ray Burns, a local ambulance driver who saw his son's murdered body at the facility and that caused him to take on the Jason persona and in fact that film ends with them setting up Tommy Jarvis to become the next iteration of Jason so even at that point it was still about Crystal Lake it was still about the place and the sort of haunting of that place and what has happened there then what happens in part six is that they decide to go back and they decide to go back to Jason as the primary character 
and that's where we see Jason returning to Camp Crystal Lake and it's trying to put those two pieces back together and part six is a very strong film and that's where we get the idea of this sort of undead possibly unkillable Jason Voorhees now from there you can see them really double down and want to focus on and invest in Jason and that I think leads to some of the chaos that happens with the later sequels so we have part seven which is still at Crystal Lake and then we have the movie that really violates that formula as much as they've changed the idea of who the killer is and how they work and whether they're alive or dead or what it's always been around Camp Crystal Lake with part eight Jason takes Manhattan we go outside of Crystal Lake and it becomes focused just on Jason as the killer and that continues a little bit with part nine which is Jason goes to hell it's not as focused on Camp Crystal Lake now how much any of that might have to do with lawsuits and things like that we'll we'll let the philosophers decide that but I think it's interesting that there's always been this tension between the killer and the player place and that the earlier movies sort of privilege place over the killer and the later films reverse that and privilege the killer over place so much so that in the last standalone Friday the 13th film of that series Jason X the place isn't even on earth anymore they go into space and so it's interesting to me that that's the evolution of that particular franchise also something else that's interesting is that the final girls don't recur throughout this series the only final girl to show up in a subsequent movie is Alice so part one's Alice shows up at the very beginning of part two and is immediately dispatched by Jason in a way she's Jason's first girl because she's the first time that Jason has killed on camera but all of the other final girls at the end of the film just sort of disappear. Now, the only other character that does recur besides Alice is Tommy Jarvis. And in fact, he's the character that recurs most often. He's in that arc of three films. And it's when the films are trying to figure out what are they valuing? What are they going to make the most important? And where they really settle on focusing on Jason Voorhees himself and the sort of history and mythology and making him into this almost mythical creature so that they can take the focus away from the place and so Tommy Jarvis although he's been put onto this arc of becoming the monster becoming the creature in that third film in the arc part six he actually becomes the savior and in fact the final girl I would argue of that film is the most forgettable of anyone in the series um, she's just there to be sort of a foil for Tommy Jarvis she's the local that's going to help him achieve what he needs to achieve but long before all of that before we go to outer space and to Manhattan and before Tommy Jarvis Jarvis gets his little three film arc we start with Annie and she encounters crazy Ralph who tells her about camp blood and that it's got a death curse and so then she goes and she's hitchhiking to get to the camp and she's picked up by a stranger in a Jeep and we never see the person's face and she's talking to them and they're not responding and then she realizes that they missed the turn to Camp Crystal Lake and the Jeep starts speeding up and so Annie is getting nervous she's getting scared and eventually she jumps out of the the vehicle and starts running through the woods around the camp and the stranger in the Jeep pursues her eventually she's cornered against a tree and she's pleading for her life and we see a shining silver hunting knife go across her throat her throat is slit and she bleeds and that's the end of Annie and then we go to the other counselors at the camp now what does this death tell us about these films and about the message is that we don't really get any sense of the killer we see part of their arm and we see the hunting knife and we see flashes of black clothing as they're pursuing Annie in the woods but the woods are the point the place is the point it's not about establishing a specific killer so with Halloween we wanted to see small sweet blonde haired Michael so that we could understand that he's being presented not as this cute child but as a vessel of evil in this case it's not about the killer it's about the place it's about camp blood it's about the death curse go to camp blood ain't you never come back again it's got a death 
Curse. And then we come to Amanda Wiss as Tina in 1984's Nightmare on Elm Street. After the success of Halloween in 1978 and Friday the 13th in 1980, there was a rush of imitation and ripoff slasher films. Films that were trying to capitalize on the momentum of this new subgenre. Some of them are very good in their own right, and some of them are just clearly cheap imitations. But when Wes Craven went about putting out Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984, he wanted to make sure that he was setting his film apart. This was not just another slasher with some mystery person lurking in the shadows, killing off a group of teenagers. In this film, the killer is front and center pretty much from the beginning. We have to learn more about him and we have to learn more about his background, but his burned face and that knife glove are always at the center. And with Robert Englund and his particular style of performance, it became very much about the personality of the killer. And so in this slasher film, unlike others, there's much more of a dual investment, not only in the victims, but also in the killers. Because you have much more of a sense of exchange between Freddy Krueger and his victims before they die. And of course, that first death also serves to establish the rules of the film. And this is really letting the viewer know that we are in a different sort of world than your typical slasher film. Slasher films, as spectacular and bizarre as the kills can be, all generally happen in the real physical world. For Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy is only able to attack you when you're asleep. And so if you're awake, you're generally safe. But when you're asleep, you are in a different world, a world that has different rules. It doesn't obey the typical laws of physics. And Freddy has a lot of power there to alter the landscape, to create things that wouldn't normally be there. And that certainly comes out in some of the more ridiculous kills later in the franchise. But even from this first death, we see that the typical rules of the physical world do not apply. And that's why that scene with Amanda Wiss as Tina is so iconic, where Freddy is attacking her and her boyfriend wakes up and sees her and she's sort of floating against the ceiling and he can see the cuts starting to happen as she's being attacked by Freddy in the dream. And so what happens to her in the dream happens to her body in the real world, but we're never able to see the killer. Only the people who are in the dream who are facing Freddy are able to see the killer himself. And I think that this is one of the ways that a lot of slasher films make us as the audience complicit in the action that's happening on screen. Just like the camera shots with the two eye holes of the Halloween mask that put us inside the perspective of Michael Myers, we are able to see Freddy any time that he is attacking one of the teenagers of Elm Street. And yet we are safe outside of the film. And so there's something in slasher movies that seems to be about this idea of voyeurism, of watching, of not taking part in the action per se, but of being complicit in it. This is probably most on the surface in 1960's Peeping Tom, a British horror film that follows a young man who films young women and has a spike mounted on the front of his camera so that he can capture their last moments. This film was very very controversial at the time, but I think that in some ways it's of the time. It comes out the same year as Psycho, where we see Norman Bates taking on the persona of his mother in order to kill people at the Bates Motel. And so we're starting to see this shift to the idea that horror and danger can exist within the people who surround us in our everyday situations. And Psycho, although it does it in a much less explicit way, does a very similar thing where it makes us identify with the killer's perspective. The film starts with us inhabiting the perspective of Marion Crane. She's getting dressed after a lunchtime tryst with her lover Sam, and she's talking about what she wants her life to be. And then she goes back to work, and she takes money from her employer. Her boss has this new client who's buying a house for his daughter, a rich man who's sort of showing off his money and throwing it around, and says that he never carries more than he can afford to lose, is kind of set up as the this opportunity for Marion to change her life and finally be able to be with Sam if she commits this crime. And of course we know that stealing is wrong, but we like Marion. We are in Marion's perspective and she is our protagonist. And so because this rich man is so boastful and says 
that he can afford to lose it, we think, why not take it? Why not use this as your chance for happiness? And so she takes the money and she hits the road. And then she's followed by this very ominous police officer who seems to know something or is very suspicious of her. And he's set up as this very clear and present threat. Even though he's a representation of the law, he's threatening and he's sort of always showing up where Marion happens to be. It's kind of creepy. So Marion keeps going and there's a big storm and she ends up out at the Bates Motel. And that's where she meets Norman, this awkward, kind of sweet, if a little strange young man who runs the Bates Motel under the iron fist of his domineering mother. After having a quiet dinner with him where he gets to say one of the classic lines of the movie, we all go a little mad sometimes. Marion decides that she needs to go back and give the money back. And so she's calculated out how much she spent and she makes a plan to go back and return the money. So she tears up the piece of paper where she's calculated out the amount that she spent, throws it in the toilet and flushes it, which if you didn't know, a little piece of movie history trivia, that was the first time that not only had a toilet been shown on screen in any film, but it was also the first time we saw or heard a toilet flush. And then she decides to take a cleansing shower and go to sleep so she can go back tomorrow and face the consequences. Unfortunately, the consequences are already already there waiting for her in the form of Mrs. Bates, who murders her in the shower. So at this point, with Marion dead on the floor of Cabin One at the Bates Motel, we're about 30, 35 minutes into the film, and the only real perspective that we've had to identify with is Marion's. And so now, as the viewer, we have to find somewhere else to put our sympathetic attachment. Now, if we look at the characters that are in the film and the ones that are then introduced as the story continues, the only logical place for us to be sympathetic is with poor sweet Norman. Marion's sister Lila shows up and she's looking for Marion, but she's kind of pushy, she's aggressive, she's not very nice. Sam, her boyfriend, is sweet but kind of oafish and not very interesting. And then of course there's the detective Arbogast, who is very suspicious and rude, and he's not somebody that we would identify with. And so anytime any of these characters interact with Norman, it's very easy for us to place our sympathetic identity identification with Norman, because at this point, we don't know that he's done anything. As far as we know, it's his mother. The same way that she has dominated and controlled Norman, she has also destroyed our previous perspective, Marion. And so we are sort of in cahoots with Norman. We are also victims of Mrs. Bates' oppressive behavior. And so the ending is that much more shocking when it's revealed that Mrs. Bates has been dead for years, and Norman has just been taking on her persona, because now we are implicated in Marion's death. We are implicated as spectators, as viewers, because we sympathize with Norman, because we took on his perspective, and when we see him revealed in the fruit cellar, we are a part of that. The same way that the viewer is a part of the murders in Peeping Tom. The difference between the two is that Psycho covers it up. Psycho convinces you that Norman is a good guy, that he's somebody you should sympathize with. Whereas Peeping Tom makes it clear that you are taking part in these murders from the very beginning. It's much more on the surface, it's much more aggressive, and that's why it probably received the type of critical response that it did compared to Psycho. And if Psycho is the genesis point of the slasher subgenre, then Marion Crane is the very first of the first girls. And as is typical with these final girl characters, their death sets certain rules and puts in place certain tropes for us to understand the film. And because Marion is the first, I think that her presentation actually impacts all of those later final girls. I think there are pieces of the story of Marion Crane in Judith Myers, in Annie, in Tina. In essence, what those first girls have been doing since Marion Crane is reminding us that we are there to watch terrible things. And we are there as a spectator, but we are also complicit in what's being shown on the screen. If there wasn't a demand for horror, then horror wouldn't be made. So even though these deaths are fictional, there's a way in which we are implicated in the desire to see these kinds of acts happen on screen. And before you balk and protest, test and start a hashtag not all horror movie watchers remember that in the end it's the killer that persists 
It is the doer of evil deeds that has the longevity when it comes to these horror franchises. Heather Langenkamp, who played Nancy Thompson in Nightmare on Elm Street Parts 1 and 3, as well as Wes Craven's A New Nightmare, did a documentary about fan culture called I Am Nancy. And as she was going to horror conventions and talking to horror fans, she found a whole lot of Freddy Krueger tattoos and not a lot of Nancy Thompson tattoos. We cheer for the final girl as she triumphs over the killer, but in the end, and the film usually puts in place some sort of ambiguity that allows us to know that the killer is going to be back. Nightmare on Elm Street was always the most obvious about this. There was always some twist at the end that told you that Freddy Krueger was not gone for good. Final girls would valiantly win the day in one film only to be killed off in the first 15 minutes of the sequel. Or as we talked about with Friday the 13th, they were often discarded entirely. But even if it's the killer whose perspective persists throughout the film series, there's still the indelible presence of that first girl, the first kill, the first big moment where we see what is this film about, what is this killer about, what is the theme that we're looking for. And because of the first first girl, Marion, part of that is all wrapped up in this idea of being complicit in the events which are about to transpire. So no matter how many Freddy tattoos and Jason action figures there are in the world, Michael Myers just wouldn't have the same appeal if it wasn't for Judith Myers, his first on-screen kill, and the way that it established him as this vehicle of pure, unadulterated evil. So to all the first girls out there, we thank you for your sacrifice. You've given us hours of bloody, gory entertainment, as well as some of the most lasting, impactful characters in the horror genre. And those characters just wouldn't be the same without you. All right, y'all. I am super excited about the guest for this episode. Now, let me just say, this is completely my fault. I have been sitting on this interview for a long time. This shit is 100% pre-COVID. Sandy Johnson was so wonderful to sit down with me in, I think, January or February. And we recorded this interview and things got really busy with my job and then the world fell apart. And I just haven't been focused on podcasting the way that I should. So absolutely, my apologies to you, my apologies to Sandy for sitting on this for so long. So please know as we're talking about conventions and travel and vacation plans and all that kind of good stuff that all of this was done pre-COVID before the world changed in the before times as I like to say. But I'm still super excited to share this interview. I think that Sandy has some really interesting things to tell you about her involvement with Halloween as well as other parts of her career, her experiences with Playboy and more. So please enjoy my interview with the wonderful, absolutely fabulous ray of sunshine that is Sandy Johnson. So how are you doing this weekend, Sandy? I'm doing quite well. We've been working on a trip in an RV, so we've been making reservations and searching maps and (laughs) just vacation stuff. Well, that's exciting. Um, speaking of getting out of town, we met in Atlanta at a Days of the Dead event. When did you start doing right. conventions? Uh, my first convention was H40 in Pasadena 2018. Okay. And so that was the 40th anniversary of the original Halloween, um, where you played Correct. Judith Myers. What was, it, what was your first yes. impression? What did you think of it? Oh, wow. Uh, It was amazing. I, you know, I had just been found by my agent a few months before that. And prior to that, I really didn't even know that cons existed. So (laughs) it was, it was amazing. There were thousands of people. I had really long lines. Everybody was so excited to see me. I mean, it was just, it was amazing experience. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of great energy at conventions. Um, What's your favorite part about going to conventions? Oh, absolutely meeting the fans. Yeah, that's, uh, I. in fact, in between, I get antsy because I just really want to go back and meet more fans. Yeah, very cool. Um, Do you have any particular fan encounters that stand out as being uh, really interesting or really memorable, really fun? 
Well, let's see. I have my youngest fan. He's about, I don't know, maybe six or eight months now. And so I get an update on him all the time. So that's pretty cool. Aww. And then I have several, I have several top fans that follow me daily and uh, try to come to as many you know, uh, conventions as they can. And I, I love, I love their loyalty and they're funny and nice. And, um, I don't know. They're just, they're all, all the fans are great and, and, and all the cons have been great in different ways, but I just love all the interaction with the people and, and the crazy costumes and how elaborate they are. It's just all really fun. Yeah, definitely. There's some great cosplay and just a lot of interesting people all getting together over their love of horror, which I think is great. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah, so horror fans are probably going to know you as Judith Myers from the opening scene of the original Halloween. Um, how did that role come about? How did you get cast in that role? I got cast in that role because um, I had been a, a, a playboy, playmate, and the people in Halloween were looking for someone who was an actress but was also a nude model so that the nude scene wouldn't uh, present a problem. So I think that's probably why I got the initial call was because of that. And what was, how long did you spend on set? How long was it uh, filming that opening? It seems like we were there two days. There was a lot of work going on, you know, on the set because they were trying to fix it all up because they had actually already shot all the stuff with it being seen as an old house. And so they were trying to get it all fixed up for um, my scene. And so there was kind of a lot of work still going on. I think it's interesting because it's such a small moment, but it's also, you know, one of the most iconic moments of that movie um, that where they film it with the mask over the camera with the eye holes or give that illusion. When you made the movie, well, did you know that it was going to have the impact that it had on horror history? No, I had no idea. I, I'm not sure anybody did. Um, were you a fan of horror before you got cast in that part? I was. Yes, I've I liked. Um, of course, I've always liked things like uh, Hitchcock and things like that. But I liked uh, was Linda Blair, The Exorcist, and The Shining, and uh, um, kind of that genre. Not uh, more kind of suspenseful and different, interesting storylines, not just the straight gore for no reason. Although I love uh, Halloweens because they have that, I don't know, the interesting photography and the stalking aspects, and it's just just interesting. So I like horror films that are interesting, not just gory. Yeah, definitely, that have a story. And I think that that, um, you know, a lot of the movies from the 80s, have and you know the earlier ones like Halloween that kind of lead into the horror boom of the 80s they have a little bit more of that story element sometimes the story got a little crazy but they had much more of a like basis right. to it <laughs> right and what I think is interesting too and I think that this yeah. is uh in terms of the character of Judith Myers is that we talk a lot about the final girls so we talk about you know the girl who lives to the end and survives and um, you know, maybe shows up in the next movie, maybe doesn't. Um, but I think people don't spend enough time talking about the first girl um, or the first victim that is on screen. And I think that if you really go back and look at sort of the big horror franchises, the first girl in some ways is one of the most iconic scenes from every one of those movies. You know, that if people see an image of you being seen through the eyes of that mask, it, most people, they immediately know that that's Halloween. They know that that's Michael Myers' sister. You know, Robbie Morgan, who was in Friday the 13th, who is the first victim of Pamela Voorhees, and, and then Amanda Wiss in Nightmare on Elm Street. So there's something that's very appealing about that first girl, that first, uh, the first kill on screen. Why do you think um, those scenes become so iconic and so important to fans? Well, it's probably because when you're when you're sitting down to watch a movie, you you know, unless it's just a, a uh, remake or something, you don't really know what's going to happen. So you're super 
tuned into it and your anticipation is there because you know it's a horror movie, so something is going to happen. So I think when that first one comes, it just it hits you because you're so tensed and kind of, you know, not knowing when and where it's going to come. So I think it has an impression just because it is the first one and you don't know really how it's going to happen or where it's going to come from. Or So it's, it, I think it's kind of a surprise element and it just kind of embeds in your brain that first one of, of a movie. Yeah, definitely. And we get to eventually, especially with those franchises, you know, they send so many teenagers into the line of fire, but that's always the first one. That's the one that um, was the first one that kind of introduced that character. Right. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit, too, about your Instagram, because if people have not seen your Instagram, it's at Unicorn Sandy J, and it is one of my favorite things on Instagram. I love it. I love it so much. And you're creating this whole... Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, you're creating this really interesting collection of <laughs> photos and images where you're sort of creating this almost alternate history of Judith versus Michael and really kind of reinventing it and always sort of reimagining it in different ways. Um, how did that come about? Um, well, it started at a convention. I think it might have been uh, Texas Frightmare Weekend. And some of the fans started asking me, no, you know what? It was the one before that, maybe two before that. Shoot. Maybe it was maybe it was uh, Cherry Hill because I already had it by the time I got to Texas. But anyway, the fans were asking if I was on social media because they wanted to keep in touch with me in between cons. And so I told them, no, I, I didn't tap that. So when I got back home, I started to think about it. And I said, well, I, I suppose I could start a Facebook and an Instagram. And I thought, but what am I going to put on there? Because I've been out of the industry a long time and I haven't done any films recently other than my scene in, you know, Halloween 2018. So I just started kind of brainstorming what I would put on there. So I decided that I needed to probably do a photo shoot so I would at least have some recent photos. My mind always keeps going. <laughs> and so it led not just to glamour shots, but I thought, you know, it'd be really cool just to, you know, find some Halloween themes that I could shoot or, you know, kind of go, go with that. And then I put it out to the fans. I said, give me some ideas. What would you like to see? So I took in their ideas and then my own brainstorming. And then I had a really good photographer and we just started to kind of tell a story. That's kind of where it started, just with glamour shots and then on to trying to tie it in with Halloween and then all, all the input from the fans. And it just kind of grew and just kind of became a big project for me. Yeah. And you do. My favorite one that I saw was uh, it was so interesting. It was you and Michael playing chess and you're holding a gun under the table and he's holding a knife under the table and just that sort of interesting tension I thought was so it was such a new way of viewing those two characters thank you yeah I was just sitting there looking at the chess table and I thought you know that might be kind of an interesting competition between the two with the game thing but yet uh, not just Michael with a weapon, but me with one as well. <laughs> so it, it kind of went from there and it, it actually turned out pretty cool. I liked it. Yeah, I like that. That you've got some of those where Judith is a little bit more empowered and there's a little bit more balance between the two. It's just a really interesting sort of concept for that. Cool. I'm glad you like it. I've been having fun with it. Yeah, it's been very cool. And who are your Michaels? So you've got a couple Michaels. You've got adult Michael and then child Michael. Right. I have, um, I actually have three Michaels. I oh. have the child Michael, which is actually a mannequin. And I have the Michael front with the 2018 mask. And that is a very good uh, friend of mine, her adult son. And then the original uh, Michael Myers mask. That is my husband, Dan. And the reason why he only does one of them is because he has a big head. <laughs> <And> he <laughs> can't fit. 
in the other one. And so I tried everything to make it work. I slid it down the back. I did everything and uh, just couldn't make it work. So I had to find another Michael. All right. So child Michael is a mannequin? Hey everybody, editing Miss J stepping in here for just a second. This is where I kind of lost my goddamn mind that the child Jason that appeared in some of Sandy's photos was a mannequin. Maybe it won't seem like that as you're listening, but just know that I was very surprised. <laughs> Enjoy. He is. He is He is a mannequin, and um, I tried very hard to make him look alive. I, well, you were successful because I thought, oh, maybe that's like her grandchild or something. Um, I thought it was, you know, maybe a kid yeah. from the family. <laughs> yeah, people ask me a lot if it's a grandchild or what. And since he is actually holding a knife sometimes, I figured maybe a mannequin was better. Yeah, that's probably a good option. <laughs> Um, another thing that you've been doing that I think is really interesting, because this service has kind of gotten bigger over the last couple of years, is you do cameos sometimes. you want to tell me a little bit more about that service and what kind of things you've done for cameo? Yeah, cameo is where someone requests that I do a video for them, and it can be like Merry Christmas or Congratulations, or I've done a couple where... They wanted me to talk about a project or a company that they have. I've done a couple for um, On Pins and Needles LLC with Maggie. She has that great outdoor live adventure with Jason Friday the 13th. And uh, I was just so intrigued with what she was doing that I originally just started talking to him. We kind of became friends. And then she's actually hired me a couple times to do kind of a promo one and then the other one was just kind of a congrats to her team for a year that they've done a really good job and then I've just done some for fans where they just want me to say how wonderful they are (laughs) (laughs) and they are so that's easy and uh, then I had a a birthday I did a birthday one so yeah they're really they're really fun and I do try and take the time to make them special for the person not just a quick you know happy birthday but actually some other stuff that they would enjoy sharing. So so they've been fun. And that and cameo.com, they just go there and look up Sandy Johnson and or they can actually get there directly from my website too. Yeah, that's very cool because horror fans especially I think are so dedicated to the films and the franchises that they love. And so getting a specialized greeting from somebody who is in something that they care so much about just seems like a really cool, unique gift to do. Yes, it it is a good gift, and it it's been really fun to see their reactions, and and it means a lot to them, which means that it means a lot to me also. Yeah, very cool. You mentioned earlier that you were a Playboy playmate, and I, so, I was. yeah, and that was uh, when were you a playmate? In June of nineteen seventy four. So, what was the experience like of being a Playboy playmate? It was uh, actually pretty amazing. The uh, photographers were fabulous. The locations were great. We went to the beach. We went to Chicago. Um, We went to the mansion in Chicago and also L.A. They had just wonderful sets. So it was, of course, they had all the wardrobe. I mean, it was really nicely done. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. And, of course, I got a lot of work from it, which was nice, too. And uh, of course, the, the main reason I did it was that my father was very sick uh, with cancer and he wanted a treatment that was only available in Mexico and it was expensive. So I needed a, a way to make some money so I could help him with that. So that was actually the original reason I did it. But it it also turned out to be a good thing. It was a lot of fun. And like I said, I got a lot of work from it and uh, some travel and, and it was just fun. Yeah, and it led to this whole sort of uh, legacy now with Halloween and um, and all of these other opportunities. So that's that's pretty exciting. Yes, uh, it was. Um, what were your impressions of Hugh Hefner? Well, Hugh Hefner was very nice. He was obviously a playboy. He had a lot of parties. He had a lot of friends and probably a lot of hangers on, too. <laughs> <laughs> always surrounded by people. I don't think I ever remember seeing him alone. Uh, he loved extravagant things. He had a, you know, a very fancy house. He had a zoo on property. He had a pool with waterfalls and a cave that you could go in and have a drink. I mean, he was just an extravagant 
kind of person. Uh, but I always liked him. He was very nice. He very personable. And like I said, he had great parties and he was just a fun kind of social guy. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by him. I think as a figure, he's just a very complex, interesting kind of guy. And just what he did with that magazine for sexuality in America. And, you know, he's certainly not perfect. And there's some, you know, criticisms of him, but also just the way that he sort of championed an opening up of sexuality, I think is really interesting. Right. Yeah, I agree. And and most of the photography, uh, I really haven't looked at it much lately, but back then the, the photographs were really beautiful. So there was there was a lot of class of the photography and he hired great photographers, which was nice. There was always just such a different level to what they were presenting in the magazine. And you know, the old joke about you read it for the articles. And I think people don't always realize that you really could read it for the articles. There were really interesting, well-researched articles. They featured fiction by amazing writers, you know, first preview fiction and just really amazing content. Right, that's true. Yeah, they were pretty great magazines. And you've done some other film work as well. What are some other films that you've appeared in? I appeared in Hoss, H-O-T-S, and uh, Gas Pump Girls, and Jokes My Folks Never Told Me. What are those films like? Are they commercially available? I know I was looking through and I was like, I don't know if I've seen those. I used to watch a lot of USA Up All Night, so I was like, I wonder if I've seen... Um, anything like that, because they've had a lot of um, kind of fun uh, retro movies on that when I, way back in the 90s when I was in high school. But are they kind of like fun B-movie type things? They are. They were just kind of drive-in fun movies with obviously nudity and pretty girls and not too deep content, (laughs) (laughs) but just fun to watch. They, They were lots of fun to make. Yeah, they were fun to make. And you, I think some of them you can see maybe on YouTube. Some might be available on eBay. Not totally sure. But I think some of my fans have said they've seen some of them on YouTube. And there, and there might be other subscription services, you know, that have them. Yeah, I think it's kind of a shame that now, um, you know, we have all this potential with streaming services and Netflix and Hulu and all the other ones. But it seems like they're purging a lot of their independent content and more kind of vintage content and B-movie content and really just focusing on those big blockbusters. And I think that's a shame. I mean, I grew up in the 90s with the USA Up All Night with Rhonda Shear and Gilbert Gottfried. And I loved discovering those kind of oddball fun movies. And I think we don't, those are available, but they're just not available through the like most easy to find channels. Yeah, that's very true. I'm pretty sure that I saw jokes my folks was on youtube and somebody or a couple of people had said they had seen hot so they're out there somewhere i guess if you just have to know where to look jokes my folks never told me that one is more of like a, a sketch kind of show is that right i looked up some information on that it's kind of like almost like a sketch comedy with kind of a like a sexy sort of undertone or overtone <laughs> yeah. yeah jokes my folks is a series of jokes from like the 70s that are extremely corny and and, uh of course at the time they were cutting edge (laughs) now they're just straight (laughs) corny but back then they were pretty racy i guess and they had sexy girls in each scene with guys or men or whatever to tell you know to tell the joke or to act out the joke so i was the i was the farmer's daughter yeah because i remember that in the 80s someone in my school found this like adult joke book and it was uh it was just sort of everybody was sort of fascinated by it we were kids and so there used to be that kind of more adult humor that kind of made its way down to middle school and I think it's an interesting premise to take that and kind of turn them into vignettes and give them sort of a cinematic life right and and at the time I mean that kind of thing really hadn't been done yeah, so at the time, it was kind of really different than the things that, you know, that had been done. And, and the jokes, of course, were considered funny at the time. <laughs> yeah, pushing some boundaries. I like that. So you said that uh, you did a scene for Halloween 2018. Any interest in doing more kind of horror film work or other film work? Are you thinking about maybe having some guest spots in some horror films coming up? 
Yeah, I would love that. The problem with me is I live in a rural area. I don't live near a big city, you know, for going to interviews and stuff. So it would actually have to be something where the film was actually looking for me in particular. Because I, I just got in a situation to be driving, you know, to, to a big city to go on interviews all the time. So if they were actually looking for me, sure, I would consider it to be awesome. Yeah, that would be very cool. And that's something that I've seen at the horror convention as well, is that there definitely is an interest in bringing back a lot of these figures from classic horror movies and having people who people can say, I remember that person from this movie that I love and giving them kind of a different sort of perspective and different kinds of characters to play. So there's definitely some opportunity there. I think that would be fun. Yes, I think so too. Any other big projects planned for the Instagram or just uh, continuing to make the the fun content that you've been doing? Anything new planned? I will probably, you know, do another photo shoot at some point. I have had fans suggest some really cool ideas that I hope I can find what I would need to make them happen. Some of them would be a challenge, but it'd be very cool if I could pull it off. So, yeah, probably some more photo shoots and um, uh, maybe some more things on my website. Right now I have some photos and I have the tombstones by Cemetery Haunts, and people can send in items to get them autographed. So, and then of course they can access my podcasts and cameo and stuff on there too. So maybe if I'll come up with some more ideas for what I could put on there for fans. Very cool. Yeah, I almost forgot to ask you about the signed tombstones. You are working with an artist who has an Etsy shop, right? <laughs> Is that where they sell those? Yes. Yeah, Jennifer, she's on Instagram at Cemetery Haunts, and she is an extremely talented lady and a very nice lady. I like her very much. She does, she's done tombstones for movies and movie sets and all kinds of different things. She's just super talented. And she is the one that, that has made the, the very best Judith Myers tombstone. So originally we were only offering them signed to fans who went to a show where she was there and they would carry it over and have me sign it. Right after this last show, I got a hold of her and I said, what would you think about if we offered the tombstones and you shipped them to me, I signed them and then shipped them to the fan. And she thought it was a really good idea. So, so that's what we're doing now. They can do it either through her website or through my website and they can actually get, uh, she has three different sizes so they can get the one that they want and it comes to me, and then I autograph it and, and mail it on. And, and they are just spectacular. They're just gorgeous. So that, And, the, of course, all the fans that have seen them in person are obviously impressed because they're just great. Any final last things that you want to share with our listeners? I always feel blessed for all the Halloween fans. They've just been awesome to me. And I just hope I get to meet more and more of them at every con because I love it. Absolutely. Well, we'll be looking for you uh, at a future convention. I am excited to get to see you in person again. And it was lovely to talk yes, to you. Yes, well, thank you. And I, I love you. So I'm so happy that you asked me to do this. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. I adore you. I I had so much fun last year in Atlanta. It was just such a fun time. So it was wonderful. Definitely. All right, we'll do it again. All right, I hope you enjoyed my interview with the absolutely wonderful Sandy Johnson. As I mentioned in the interview, I met Sandy at a Days of the Dead event in Atlanta in 2019, and she actually asked if I would take a photo with her and her friend and a couple of the other castmates that were there from Halloween. And so I will make sure that as I'm promoting the episode, I will include those on my Facebook and on my Instagram. So you can check those out. It was a fun photo, and I had a mask that was painted by my friend Angie from Beautiful Eccentric, which is one of my gender-bent horror icons, and that's actually one that we are going to be shooting a little bit later this year. So I'm super excited to start on those gender-bent horror icon photos, and it's just fun how this is all coming together at the same time. If you'd like to find out more about Sandy, find out more about ordering autographs, photographs, tombstones, those kinds of things, or maybe ordering a cameo from Sandy, you can check out her website at unicornsandyj.com. 
And I know we've been a little bit quiet here at the podcast. There are new episodes of Jeunesse After Dark and Miss J the Renovation that are forthcoming. But don't forget to also check out my new passion project, which is my YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube.com, you can search for Janessa J. Champagne. J-A-N-E-S-S-A-J-A-Y-E Champagne, spelled just like the drink. And if you want more of Sandy Johnson, don't forget that very soon we'll have another Sloppy Seconds episode that will feature outtakes from Sandy Johnson's interview interview as well as my interviews with Katie Cadaver and Crystal Connor. Thank you so much for stopping by. I'm your girl Miss J and until I see you again, bye. This episode of Janessa After Dark includes royalty-free music from bensound.com. This episode includes the tracks Actionable, which serves as our podcast intro, the song Happiness, which played as bumpers on either side of Sandy Johnson's interview, and the track Sexy, which you're listening to now. For these and more great royalty-free tracks, don't forget to visit bensound, that's B-E-N sound.com. Janessa After Dark is written and directed by Chris M. Stoner and is a Champagne Dreams production.